Good day. Welcome to Bible Class Topics. In this lesson, we want to look at Matthew 5, 41, where Jesus said, If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Our topic today, two-mile service. In Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, we have what is normally called the Sermon on the Mount. And this sermon is made up of many topics, all of which are important. But we want to take a look at Matthew 5, 38 through 42, which the editor of my Bible has entitled, Concerning the End of Resentment and Retaliation. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Turn the other cheek. Even when receiving a direct and calculated insult, the Christian cannot retaliate or even resent it. Yes, this is a hard teaching. Yes, we will not be able to follow it perfectly, but it is an ideal that we need to strive for. Taking our tunic and offering our cloak, the law of Moses forbade permanently taking someone's cloak as a pledge in Exodus 22, 26, and 27. If you ever take your neighbor's cloak in pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down, for that's his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body, and what else shall he sleep? If he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. When we think about this, statement in the old law concerning taking a neighbor's cloak in pledge, as Christians, we need to think about the fact that we cannot use our legal rights as leverage. You know our legal rights. It's the first thing that repeat offenders call for when they're arrested. They want their rights. Christians have rights the same rights that everyone else in the country has. But Christians aren't the ones that go around calling for their rights. Why? Christians put their duties before their rights. Christians put their responsibilities before their privileges. If you'd like to study more with me concerning the Sermon on the Mount, we have a full set of videos uh, covering all of go uh, the Gospel of Matthew. You can go to the playlist and find that set of videos, and then you can go to Matthew chapter 5. I believe it's in three separate videos for Matthew 5. I'll put a link uh, to the description in the description below to the particular video covering Matthew 5, 38 through 42. Two mile service, going the extra mile. In the first century, this type of impressment was common in occupied countries such as Palestine. Remember Simon of Cyrene? Jesus could not carry his cr uh, cross so they impressed Simon to carry it for him the rest of the way. We must do our duties as a service gladly rendered. What do the inefficient worker, the resentful servant, and the ungracious helper have in common? They're not living the Christian life. The Christian, meanwhile, is ready to help even if the request is unreasonable. Jesus said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This lesson is going to be a hard pill to swallow for all of us, including yours truly. 
It seems sometimes that we feel we are being persecuted and we want our rights. Well, we are Christians and we will be persecuted and we may not get to have our rights, but we have to be ready to give two-mile service. Regardless, our service is to please God and not men. We'll talk about that for a minute and then we'll give some examples of the principle applied. Ephesians 6 verses 5 through 8, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with the good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. We're to please God and not men. If we render good service, that is glory to God. If we render poor service, that is a shame to God. One man that brought shame to God is King Saul. His failure can be seen in 1 Samuel 15, starting in verse 3 and carrying on from there. You remember, he was charged to destroy the Amalekites. Well, he destroyed a lot of the Amalekites, but he didn't destroy all of them. He spared King Agag, and he spared some of the herds. That was the end of his relationship with God. And it wasn't much longer after that that God, through Samuel, chose someone new to be the king. King Saul failed to render two-mile service to God. Someone who did render two-mile service to God is David. In 1 Samuel 24 and 1 and the following verses, Saul had been chasing David all over the country trying to kill him. David hid in a cave. Saul came into that cave to relieve himself. And while he was in there, David had an easy opportunity to kill Saul, but he did not do it. He said, I cannot kill God's anointed. While Saul did not render two-mile service to God, King David did render two-mile service to God. Listen to the warning for us. Luke 16, 15, And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And don't we see that in today's world? John 15, 18 and 19, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore... The world hates you. Then Paul says this in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, For I am now seeking the approval of man or of God. Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, then I would not be a servant of Christ. With these thoughts in mind, with the example of King Saul's failure, and King David's success in rendering two-mile service, and the warnings that we've read in the passage from Luke, John, and Galatians, let's talk about examples of the principle applied. What of Lot's wife? We read this story in Genesis 19. Sodom and Gomorrah were being destroyed by God. Lot took his wife and his family and began to leave the city. Lot's wife went the first mile, but she failed to go the second mile. What do we mean by this? 
Remember, they were commanded not to look back upon the city. Lot's wife looked back upon the city, and she turned to a pillar of salt. We have a, another video here on the channel entitled, Remember Lot's Wife. If you haven't seen that, perhaps you can give that a look sometime in the future. Someone else who went the first mile but did not complete his journey is Moses. Matter of fact, Moses went more than the first mile. But he didn't make the last mile of the way. In Numbers 20, verses 10 through 12, Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their livestock drank. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Do you remember this story from the Old Testament? God had told Moses to speak to the rock, but he chose in his fury against the people to strike the rock. He did not give two-mile service to God, and because of this, he and his brother Aaron were both banned from leading the children into the land of promise. What about a positive example of two-mile service? Well, we have the Macedonians, as discussed in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. And while I'm talking about other videos on the channel, we are currently engaged in a study of 2 Corinthians here on the channel. The Tuesday morning post is a study of 2 Corinthians, Paul's letter. The Macedonians gave themselves first to the Lord. That was their one-mile service. And then they gave themselves to Paul, and that was their two-mile service. Paul said, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. With these negative and positive examples in mind, let's discuss our own actions. We need to be kind to the gentle, but we also need to be kind to the sinner. 1 Peter 4, 18 and 19, If the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. It's easy to be kind to our families. I say that, and we look around the world and see many families that are in turmoil among themselves. It should be easy to be kind to our families, be kind to our loved ones. But what about those that rub us the wrong way? What about those that are in sin? We need to be kind to the gentle, but we also need to be kind to the sinner. That would be two-mile service. Speaking of being kind, we need to speak kindly to your friends. Speak kindly to our friends, and we need to speak kindly to our enemies. Back to Matthew chapter 5, this time verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. 
For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. We need to strive to be like our Heavenly Father. To be like our Heavenly Father, we have to go the extra mile. If we are forgiven, we in turn need to forgive. Also in the Sermon on the Mount, now Matthew 6, 13 and 14, as he's teaching the disciples how to pray, and lead us not into temptation, we are to pray. But deliver us from evil, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. So in forgiveness, we have to go the extra mile. We have to go beyond our own forgiveness. God has forgiven us. Now he charges us to forgive others. Paul said this in Colossians 3, 12 and 13, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. God expects us to work for a living. He expects us to make a living and then use it correctly. In Matthew 6, 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I'll leave it to you to go back and read that part of Matthew 6 to see what these things are. Someone who did not use his money correctly, he had money, he made money, but he didn't use it correctly, is the rich fool in the parable of the rich fool found in Luke chapter 12. If you remember this parable, a man thought that things would go his way no matter what. So he went about using his money to make more money, and he had no use for God. And he died. The conclusion of the parable in chapter 12, verse 21 of Luke, So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. We, can, we need to make money. We need to use it correctly. Ephesians 4, 28, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12. For even when we were with you, Paul said, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. He told the young preacher Titus in chapter 3, verse 14 of that letter, And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. Paul says we need to work, but we need to work good works. He told the other young preacher, this time Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, Verse 1 in the first part of verse 2, Let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, 
so the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they're brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefited by their good service are believers and beloved. We need to worship on the Lord's Day. That's the first mile. The second mile is to meet with our churches, with our congregations, whenever they choose to meet. We've already talked about Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God. Hebrews 10, 25, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. When I see this passage, right away I notice the reason for meeting with one another. It's to encourage one another. If you're not there, how are you going to encourage anyone? If I'm not there, how am I going to be encouraged? We need to obey our leaders. In the Hebrew letter, chapter 13, verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls, as those who have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. If the church leaders request our presence, we need to be there. I dare say we are obligated to attend. Obviously, during the present distress of 2020, 2021 and 2022, the coronavirus, some have needed to stay home. And of course, we're not talking about coming out and putting a danger to your, to your life by worshiping in a case such as that. But... I know there's some of you around the world that no matter, coronavirus or not, to worship, you have to put yourself in danger. And may God bless you, and you're in our prayers. We need to worship in accordance with God's will, and we need to avoid evil. In Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, verses 13 through 16, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall the saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all the people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And finally, We need to save ourselves, but we need to save others too. Acts 2, verse 40. The church is in its infancy here. Peter has been preaching to them, the other apostles as well. And this concerns Peter, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. And then in chapter 8, verse 4, the church is under persecution and they've been scattered away from Jerusalem and out into Judea and Samaria and even further into Philistia. But the, but the writer, who we presume to be Luke of, 
of Acts of the Apostles, says this, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church in, their first, in his first letter, chapter 1, verse 8, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. God expects us to choose to go the second mile. The first mile is important, but it's not everything. We need to render two-mile service to God, two-mile service to our fellow man, and then we will be in a right relationship with God. You can always get a hold of me here on the channel by leaving a comment below, or you can privately send me an email at BibleClassTopics at gmail.com. Thank you for studying with me today. Thank you for your support of this channel. It's greatly appreciated. I will say that I took the photo um, here from StockSnap.io. It was a photo posted by Chad Madden, and it was there for free use as long as we give him credit. And so we have done that. And I hope that you are doing well. I hope that you are praying, praying for yourselves, praying for your loved ones, praying for the world, praying for your enemies. And if you have an opportunity, please pray for the work that I'm doing here on this channel. You continue to be in my prayers as well. Till we meet again, may God bless.